Have you uh, ever had somebody break a promise? Sure, right? Silly question. Of course, of course, somebody has, right? We've all we've all done it. We could talk all day about the promises people have have broken, right? If you uh, if you raise kids, you know you know the feeling, right? Oh, I'll clean my room tomorrow, first thing. If you let me not do it tonight, right? It never happens. Those those kind of things. Right? There's all kinds of promises. A friend says they'll they'll uh, they'll meet you or they'll pay you back your loan. It never happens, right? Uh, people just continue to fail us time after time. And and what we learn as we uh, get experience in life is that you can't really count on people. Right? They just continue to let us down. But what we learn as we mature as a Christian is that we can count on God. Always. See, God doesn't break a promise. It's in his nature to not be able to lie. And if he doesn't lie, if he says he's going to do something, he will. And you can count on it to happen. Right? You can, can know that that's going to take place. Somebody uh, a while back went through and counted the promises in Scripture. And they came up with like 7,474. I didn't verify that. If you want a homework assignment this week, please go ahead and do that. There's lots. We know that for sure thousands of promises throughout Scripture. And we also know this about God. He's, he's going to, to keep them all. Every one of them. Some promises God's are already kept. Some promises are out there ready to, to be fulfilled still. And some are, are universal and apply to, to, to all of us. But there are lots of promises throughout Scripture. And when we read those promises, we can know without doubt that they will happen. That's just who God is. God says something and God does something. It's really hard for us to understand that God will fulfill these promises and keep these promises because we're so used to promises being broken in the world that we live in by the people that we interact with on a regular basis. But that's not how God works. God, when he says something, he will do it. Now, to help us understand that a little bit, we've got to understand some things about God's promises. First, God fulfills his promises. God answers his promises. God keeps his promises in his time. You see, God, he's not in a hurry, right? He's he's not rushed around all the time trying to to get everything done. God has a time. Here's, Here's one of the really hard things for me to understand about God is he sees everything all at once. But not only does he see everything that's happening at this moment all at once, he sees all of time all at once. So we're, we see a little uh, speck, we see a little moment, we see a little blip on the radar, and we try to analyze everything that's going on and, and all that's around us by that one little idea. Somebody described it as driving down the highway, looking through uh, your windshield through a straw. And that's that's kind of how we see it. But God sees all the way from, from Genesis 1 until the end of time, God sees all of that all at once. So God fulfills his promises. God answers his promises in his time. He's not late, right? He's not not slipping up. He's not forgetting about it. He's he's on his time. So what we've got to learn as Christians when it comes to God's promises is that we, uh, we can wait. Not worry that God will answer a promise. Not worry that God will come through. But we can wait in that time. See, it's not if God will fulfill a promise or if God will answer a promise or if God will do what he says he will do, but when will God do what he says he will do? And then in the meantime, we wait. Because you know what? God doesn't forget. He doesn't forget. If, if you're like me and you've made promises or commitments, there's times when uh, it's almost the, the due date or the time for that to come up and you, uh, you remember last second. You find yourself scrambling around and rushing and trying to, trying to get stuff done to meet this promise and this commitment you kept. That's not how God works. Right? God isn't, isn't running late in his plan. He, he's not at the end trying to, to shove everything together and, and make everything work and fit and, and, and happen so his promise can be kept. That's not how God does it. He's not late. He doesn't forget. He keeps his time. It's hard for us to understand that because that's not how we do business. That's not how we are. But that's how God is. 
Another thing about God's promises that we, we have to realize is, is context. And that's a, that's a big one here, right? Context. When we look at the promises of God, and, and you're counting all of those this week, uh, all 7,000 of them, uh, what, what you need to pay attention to is a few things, right? Who is he talking to? Who was the promise directed at? What are the circumstances surrounding these things that God was, was talking about? Because not all promises in, in Scripture are, are written the same or apply the same. Let, let me give you some examples. There's some promises that are what we'll call universal promises. They apply to everybody. They always have. Uh, like, come to me when you're burdened and I'll give you rest. Okay, that applies to everybody. That's a, a promise that we can all hold to, that we can all understand. That is something that applies to all of us. Or, or if you believe in me, you'll have eternal life. Again, a universal promise. That, that applies to everybody. That's not a specific person. That's not... A promise at a specific time. That's something we can can all do. But there's also these these other ones, these personal kind of promises, uh, like uh, like when God said, "I will lead you to a land flowing in milk and honey." You're talking to a specific group of people about a specific time as He's going to rescue uh, Israel out of Egypt, right? Or uh, as He says uh, to to David, "Your house will continue before Me for all time." Talking King David, his throne will be established for all time, that Jesus is going to be in that line, right? That's, that's a promise in a specific time, in a specific circumstance, given to a specific person. And here's one we're all familiar with. It's in Genesis 15. I'll just read it. Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. So shall your descendants be. Specific promise at a specific time. For a specific person. Now, hopefully, we all recognize that because that's only been that's been a few weeks ago now, but it's it's been a little while. We talked about the promise that God made to Abraham. Now, obviously, we look at, at these promises and they don't apply to us. Right? We would be we'd be foolish to think that some of these things apply, right? Like like God said to to Abraham, "You'll have a son in your old age." Now, that's not one of those things that, that we all wanted to say, that's going to happen to me. That's a, God wrote it, God promised it, God said it, it must happen to me. That would be, that'd be unwise to, to hold on to that promise. What God wants us to, to see with his promises is that they have context. You know we don't want to take them out of context. The context of this promise was God establishing a covenant with Abraham God promising Abraham's descendants would be the ones that, that would be his chosen people, and that's what God established. Now, God made that promise back in, in Genesis 15, and here we are at the beginning of Genesis 21, 25 years later, and God is going to answer that promise. God's going to keep that promise. Now, it took God 25 years to keep the promise. Why? Well, only, only God really knows that, right? God had a plan. God's time was set out. It was all there. 25 years after he made the promise, God kept the promise. But what we can kind of see from what we've talked about the last several weeks is that Abraham probably just wasn't ready to receive that promise yet. He wasn't ready. He had to mature spiritually. So we know this about promises, right? That God is faithful. God keeps his word. If God says something is going to happen, if God promises something, it will take place. They should have known that. They knew that. So they would have had no need, no reason to doubt, right? But we know how that happened. They doubted. They doubted for provision. They went into Egypt. They doubted that God would provide a, a child. So they, uh, they had one with Hagar. They doubted that, that God would keep them safe. So they lied, right? That's, that's the story that happened with Abraham and Sarah. And as they, they grew closer to God, they matured. They realized that God would keep his promise the way God intended his promise to be kept. And even though they did this, this much, even though they, they failed and they had growing to do and they weren't ready yet, God was still faithful because that's who God is. God didn't fail. God kept his promise. Now that's where we pick up in Genesis this morning. Genesis chapter 21, 
we start to see this promise come true. So let's look at the first couple of verses of Genesis chapter 21 and see how God fulfills his promise. And the Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time in which God had spoken of it. So God had said and God had promised and God had met with Sarah and then God did as he said. Now remember, Sarah is 90 years old. Abraham is 100 years old, but God kept his word. So that's what God does. Now it's interesting here how, how it says it, right? For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. It happened at the time God had said it. It happened at the appointed time. Promises happen in God's time. It's a big deal to think about God's appointed time. Because everything from God, everything that happens, has a time that God has set forth. Everything happens in God's time. There's a passage of Scripture that talks about that. It's in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We all have heard it, right? A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, to mourn, to dance, to cast away and gather stones, to embrace to gain, to lose, to keep, to throw away, to tear, to sow, to silence, to speak, to love, to hate, to war, to peace. Ecclesiastes says there is a time for everything. And not just a time for everything, an ordained time, an appointed time for everything. God has the same in our life. A time for all of us. A time that he has given us. A time that, that he has provided us. A time that he has promised us. And it may not happen as soon or as quickly or as often as we want, but it's in God's plan. And what we've got to realize, what we've got to embrace, is that when God says something will happen, it will happen, but in God's time. And what God's time is, isn't a punishment to us, it's a blessing to us. God's got it under control. Because God is sovereign. God's sovereign. He understands time. He understands Everything else is going on. He sees the big picture. He knows where we fit in the, in the big scheme of all of mankind history. He knows what that looks like. So he sets forth these times. And he controls that. Now, that's a scary thought to some people, right? Some people don't like the idea of God being sovereign and, and, and knowing the time that everything will happen and having a, a time set out for everything that will take place. Because we start to think that if God is that sovereign, if God has that time, if God has set a time for things in our lives to happen, then what about my decisions? What about what, what I can do in my life? What about my free will? Where, where, does, where does that happen? Because we, for some reason, associate free will with being human. right? So, so we, we say if, if God has this set time and God has this appointed time and God has this timeline laid out for me, how can I be human? How can I have my free will? Well, there's, a, there's an author, A.W. Towser. You may have heard him or read him, but, but he, he's good at describing things. And he kind of describes, uh, describes it this way. He describes it like a, a cruise ship. Right? So it's a, it's a ship. It's bound for somewhere across the Atlantic Ocean, right? It's going somewhere, and, and there is a person in charge of that ship. It's the, the captain, okay? So the captain says, this is where we're going. This is how we're going to get there. This is the destination that's going to take place. And there's a whole bunch of people on board this ship. Okay? So they're all going to the same destination. Now, the captain is driving the ship, but the people are doing whatever they do on the ship, right? Not everybody is doing the same thing all at once. All right, you, you look around, some people are, are sunbathing, some are, are playing shuffleboard, some are eating at the buffet, that's where I spent most of my time. Some people are sleeping in the cabins, right? There's, there's all kinds of stuff going on on a cruise ship, right? But if it's all going the same direction. Now, no matter if you sit there and play shuffleboard 24 hours a day, or are in line at the buffet 24 hours a day, or sleep 24 hours a day, you're all still going to get to the same place. So you've got the choice. Right? You can break up your day, you can 
you can shuffleboard and sleep and eat and watch the shows and do all this stuff. But in the end, you're still going to make it to the destination. You can do whatever you want. You can roam around as you wish. You're still going to make it to the destination. That's, that's kind of a good way. To, it's not an airtight argument by any means, but it's a, kind of a good way to think about life. right? God's got a destination, a place for us to go. Right? He's got the confines that we're in with the cruise ship, but he still gives us the free will to be human and move around and make our choices. Right? Because that's how sovereign God is. He's, he's big enough to give free will in a predestined destination. That's, that's God. I mean, think about it, really. God has given mankind free will since Adam and Eve. Right? They had the choice. They could obey or they could disobey. They had the decision. Without any coercion or any control or any boundaries set by God, they had the choice to listen to God or to not. Now, we know what they chose, right? Now, now bear with me just for a second here. I'm, I'm going to try to work through some logic that's in my head. It, it may not always make sense, but, but here's, here, here's a thought. Man is made in the image of God, Right? We're made in the image of God. We can, we can agree to that. When we disobey God, when we sin, we become less like God. Agreed? Okay. So if we're made in the image of God and sin makes us less like God, that kind of makes us less human. Okay? So sin makes us less human. What do we call it when we are tied to sin? What are we? We are slaves to sin. You see, we, th we think that, that being able to go outside of God's will actually gives us freedom, but what it does is it actually ties us down to sin. Because in God, we are free. Outside of God, we are not. And if being like God is being human, and that's where freedom is, then, then sin distracts us from being free. We're actually more free inside the, the plan, the divine plan, the the predetermined plan of God, then we are outside of God's plan, outside of God's will, being slaves to sin. So we have more freedom in God than we do out of God. For some reason, we like to think that our ideas are, are what we, we need to have. We need to make our own choices, our own decisions, plan our own future, figure out where it is we need to go, and any idea of a higher power having any better insight than we do kind of scares us a little bit, and I'll tell you why. It's because we're all selfish. Because we think we all need what we think we all need. We, we think we know what we want, and we want to get there how we know we can. We want to be the one in control. We want to be the captain of the ship. Because for some reason, we think we can read the wind and the waves better than the creator of the wind and the waves. What God wants us to understand is that his will is the best will. His plan is the best plan. And he still wants us to be, be ourselves inside of that plan. It's going to happen. God's got a plan for you and for me. God's got a design that he wants us to follow. And he gives us our choice in between there, right? God didn't, didn't wake you up this morning and have your clothes laid out on your bed, did he? I, I wish he did sometimes. That would make life a little bit easier. He doesn't do that. He doesn't make every decision for you. But he has a place where he wants you to go. He wants you to make the choices. He wants you to have the free will. He gives you the chance to follow him or not, but he knows where he wants you to end up in his time. Via, via his plan, not by our own. That's what happened with Abraham. Abraham. God made him a promise. 25 years later, God fulfills that promise. God keeps his word. God was faithful, even when Abraham wasn't. God continued to walk down this path of, of leading Abraham and Sarah where he needed them to go, even though Abraham and Sarah tried to do things their own way, tried to run away from God, tried to ignore God. God stayed true, and God kept his word. So just at the right time, at the time God had set, Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son. And verse 3, And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Remember why we called him Isaac? What's Isaac mean? 
to laugh, right? So back a, a long time ago now, when God had, had showed up and said, Abraham and Sarah are going to have a child, both Abraham and Sarah laughed. Right? They, they snickered behind the scenes. Right? They, they kind of laughed at God and thought, how is this going to happen? I'm already too old. Right? Sarah was, what, 65? And she laughed and said, I'm too old to have a kid. God said, oh, really? Wait till you're 90. Right? They're, they're laughing behind the scenes. They're thinking, this is, this is crazy. But you know what? As God fulfills his promise, that laughter takes on a different meaning. Right? That, that laughter, that snickering they had behind the scenes now is, is, is changed into a, a household filled with laughter. They can't help but say, God is awesome. Yeah, I, I thought, I thought I was, I was, it was impossible at 65 to have a child. Now I'm 90. That's the God that we serve. The, the laughter, the meaning of that laughter has changed. Look at the next few verses here in verse 4. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Ha! The change of that laughter. It went from snickering to celebrating. Right? And you can see an impact of their lives. They named him Isaac as God had commanded. They circumcised him on, on the eighth day as God commanded. That's exactly what God has said. So they're obedient to God. And Sarah says, my, my heart laughs. Now God makes me laugh. Everybody laughs with me, not at me, not at God, not for making silly promises, but because we're that happy. And she celebrates. She celebrates. And this 90-year-old woman calls her husband old. I love it. I've borne him a son in his old age. Not I have had a son when I was old, but my husband is old. And I got him a son, and that's awesome. Right? She's happy. She's excited. That's how God works. Can you imagine these two holding this child? Right? Have you ever seen like a, a great-grandma hold a newborn baby? It's a, it's a neat look in their eyes, right? They, they've held their children and their grandchildren, and they, they know what that means. But, but holding that, that newborn baby, it's like, like there's, there's hope there, right? Like there's a, a sense of, of something good happening. And, and that's, that's how these, these parents had to be looking at this child. They had to say, this is definitely God's plan, this is definitely something that God did because we're not able to do this on our own. They had to say, this is God's. So that's a lesson that all parents have to learn, don't we? We, we have to learn that, that, that our kids aren't really ours. Right? They're, they're God's. Right? God gives them to us for a while, right? And he expects us to, to teach them some stuff but um, he wants them back. And it's, it, it, and it's a difficult lesson, right? Because uh, we're, uh, again, we're selfish and we're control freaks and we think we know what's best for our kids, right? And it, it's a tough lesson to learn and, and realize that, uh, that God has a different plan than, than maybe we do for our kids, right? We have to learn to let go. And, and sometimes... Sometimes God's got to pry our fingers open, right? He's got to let us let go, right? And that's not easy. I think Abraham and Sarah maybe approached it a little bit different. I don't think God had to pry their fingers open. I think it was evident from the moment Isaac was born that this was God's kid, right? That God had this child's life in his hands, that he had a plan, that God had ordained it and set it and established it, and, and that God had big things in store for this kid, big things outside of what Abraham and Sarah could ever dream of. Because every time they said the name Isaac, they would have thought back, when God promised me this, I laughed. And when God kept his promise, I laughed again. Every time they would have thought this had to be something that God did. They learned that lesson. 
And maybe that's why God waited 25 years right? to teach them or to let them let go. In that wait, they matured. Right? We've seen that theme, haven't we, throughout Abraham so far? We've, we've seen a couple themes. One, uh, follow God, trust God, listen to God. The other one is wait. There's a lot of waiting here. There's a lot of waiting. I, I think if we would ask people we talk to, what are you waiting for? I think everybody would have an answer. Right? I, think everybody, I think everybody would say something. We're all waiting for something. Maybe in this moment or maybe in, in life or maybe for the, the week or the month or something. We're all waiting for something. So my question to you today is, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for from God? Now there's something, I know there is, and here's, here's what we can take away as we go out and, 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 and try to embrace in this wait. One, remember, God isn't late. You're waiting, not because God forgot about you or because, because God is is slipping up in his time or, or because God got overbooked. God isn't late. God's going to answer that promise. God is going to, to hear your request, but, but it's in God's time, not yours. Remember, God does uh, for his children what he needs to in his time. So remember, God isn't late, but do this. Forget about your plan and your schedule. Because it ain't right. God, God doesn't listen to us for advice on when things should happen. Because again, we're looking through a straw on a windshield. God is looking at all of time, all of creation, all at once. But God's got a, a, a preordained, a predestined time for that to happen. So forget about your schedule. Forget about your plans. And trust in God. Wait on God. Wait in God. Have faith on Him. And as we talked before, ask him to give you wisdom in the waiting. If you're going to be there, you might as well get something out of it, right? If you're going to wait, you might as well grow as a Christian and as a person and not worry your life away that something's not going to happen. Have faith that God's going to do what God said he's going to do and grow in wisdom in this waiting period. And let's, let's, uh, we saw here from Abraham, maybe 25 years that you're waiting. 25 years that God needs you to mature. 25 years that God has in mind for whatever reason it is that God has in mind. Don't worry about it. Get smarter in it. Get better in it. Get wiser in it. And here's a big one. Right? Because it's, it's easy. After walking out of, of hearing this, that God's got a plan and God's got it all ordained and God's got this big picture, it's easy to start feeling guilty about wanting to push God's timetable quickly. We, we, we've got to be able to forgive ourselves for that. Because right? we're, we're, we're small. Our minds are finite. We're, we're little in the scheme of things. We're but a little speck on the map of all of eternity. It, it, our brains can't comprehend the way that God thinks and the way that God sees things. So forgive yourself for being short-sighted. And, and work on getting past that, to not being as short-sighted next time, to having more faith in God next time, to seeing things the way God sees them, or at least trusting him to see them for you. Because that's what God wants. God's going to keep his promises. God is going to do for you as he has promised you he will do. We have to have faith in that. We have to, to hold strong to that. And even when it, it feels like it should have happened already or that God's too late or maybe God's forgot about you, go back to this. Go back to the promise he made to Abraham and Sarah and know that when he says something will come, it will come. That's our God. That's our God. Let's not put him in the box of humans, right? Let's not put him in the, in the box of of man that breaks our promises and we break our word and, and we don't follow through with what we say and we run late and we scramble to get things done and we do things halfway. That's not our God. He's got a plan. You're a part of it. 
and he wants to show it to you in his time. So finally, we've been talking about Abraham and Sarah having a child for how many weeks now? And we're there. The child is born. It's great, right? It's fantastic. But we're not done yet, are we? We've got, we got some more Abraham to learn. So we'll pick up there next week. Anybody have anything this morning? All right. Let's sing one more song.